I want to invite you to turn to Mark 2, if you will, this evening, Mark chapter 2. You know, although Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, as the Old Testament scriptures said that he would be, he grew up in the small Galilean town of Nazareth. At some point, though, we're told, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 13, that he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. It seems to have been roughly about the time he began his public ministry. And Capernaum was the most important city on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And so even though when you read through the Gospels, he is still referred to as Jesus of Nazareth, since that's where he came from, Capernaum was basically his home. It was his home really for the remainder of his life upon the earth. Not many years, but uh, for the last few. The events that we're going to talk about this evening took place on an occasion when Jesus and his disciples had returned to Capernaum. They had been traveling to the towns nearby, and Jesus had been preaching in those towns. Uh, we'll read a little bit about that in chapter 1. And so although the events that we're going to look at take place very early in the Gospel of Mark, they actually take place in the second year of the public ministry of Jesus. It was a time when he was very popular with the people in general. And yet, when you look at the way things were going, the religious authorities were already trying to, you know, keep an eye on him. They found him to be, you know, just too radical and too threatening. And so there are a number of things about the passage that I want us to look at here in Mark chapter 2 that are interesting to me. But the, the way I want us to approach our study of the text this evening is I want us to look at the people in the text, uh, see what we can learn from them and learn about them. And I doubt that we'll cover everything that could be said uh, about these people, but I hope that we can make some observations from looking at them that will be helpful to us. And so let's begin in, in uh, Mark chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. And when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could, uh, could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. And so as so we just look at the, the people in here, I want us to first just talk about what we learn about Jesus from this. And there's just a, a few simple things that we see in here. One, the obvious is that Jesus healed the sick. Uh, by this point in the public ministry of Jesus, he was... He was known for his ability to do that. If you could go back to chapter 1 for just a moment and start reading there in verse 32. It talks about that evening, uh, that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick and, uh, uh, with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And then on the next day, verse 35, and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. I mean, Jesus is popular at this point in time. And so whether it was leprosy or blindness or deafness or paralysis or uh, demon possession, whatever it was, Jesus had the ability to fix the problem. And as you can imagine, that made him extremely popular with the people. And when you look at that, why did Jesus do that? One thing I think we need to recognize is that Jesus truly cared about people. He cared about people who were in trouble. 
And I think you get a good glimpse of that here at the end of chapter 1. In verse 40, we read about a leper coming to him and imploring him and kneeling, saying to him, If you will, you can make me clean. And verse 41 says, Moved with pity or compassion, some translations say, he stretched out his hand and touched him, which, he, you know, law of Moses, that makes you unclean, uh, and, and, and said to him, I will be clean. If you will it, you can make me clean. Jesus says, I will it. I, I'm willing to do this. I want this to take place. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. That is a remarkable picture of the compassion of Jesus. And we need to see that Jesus really did care about people. That's one of the reasons why he did the things that he did. That's ultimately why he would go to the cross. But I want you to see this evening that compassion wasn't the only reason that Jesus performed miracles of various kinds. As Nicodemus would say in John chapter 3 and verse 2, when he came to Jesus by night, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. Okay, well, how do you know this, Nicodemus? For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus and others, you know, based on what he said, had connected the dots. You're not like anybody else. We've recognized that. Now, I don't know if Nicodemus understood exactly who Jesus was at that point, but he was at least heading in the right direction. He was seeing where these things led. So Jesus healed the sick, and that's the reason why. But I also want you to see that Jesus preached the gospel. He preached the good news of the kingdom. And one thing I find interesting about the, the gospel accounts is that I can't find really one instance where Jesus actually set out to heal the sick or to do anything like that. I don't see any occasions where that was the purpose of what he was doing, that he was intending to go out and do that. He was first and foremost a preacher. And I think you see that in this context here in uh, Mark chapter 1, actually, in verse 38, <clears throat> after Peter says and the others say to Jesus in verse 37 of chapter 1, everyone is looking for you, Jesus says to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also for that is why I came out. I didn't necessarily come to take care of all of these other things. I mean, that's part of the deal, but that's not the main purpose. And what I think that says to us, and you may have noticed it from time to time, is that people sometimes want Jesus to be something other than what he really is. Or they emphasize one aspect of who he is to the neglect of other aspects. And that's not really a new problem. When Jesus came into the world, people had all kinds of ideas about what they wanted him to be. And some of them wanted him to take care of their physical needs. You know, if you can feed 5,000 people with some, you know, just a few loaves of bread, you know, we'll take that and we'll take it every day. And that's what some people wanted. But Jesus didn't allow other people to define him. He still doesn't allow other people to define him. He doesn't want people to come to him merely for the things that they want, he wants people to come to him for what they truly need, what he alone can offer. And it's remarkable to me how many people will focus on things like the, the signs and the miracles that we read about in the Gospels. And you almost get the impression by talking to some people that they believe that's what, it's really what Christianity is all about. It's all these exciting things like that. But I'll just tell you this, a sign is supposed to point to something else. That's what a sign does. If it doesn't do that, if it doesn't point to a greater reality, it's not a very good sign, you know? That's how, you know, signs are supposed to work. And so the miracles of Jesus should have caused people to listen to what he said. And the reason we have some of the miracles recorded for us is so that they might point us to Jesus. That's what John says in John 20 and verses 30 and 31. Jesus did a whole lot of miracles. We didn't record all of them this, but the things that we did record are recorded so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and, and believing you might have life in his name. That's why John says he wrote what he did. And so the only way to have life in his name is to listen to him. The miracles just pointed you in the direction that you need to listen to him. But going on in this, in this chapter, you see Jesus forgiving sins. When you read what is said about in our text about the paralyzed man and him being taken to Jesus, it kind of seems like the natural assumption is that he was taken to Jesus in order to be healed of his paralysis, doesn't it? Mark doesn't really say that. But that's kind of the natural conclusion. But Jesus understood this, this man had a greater need than to be physically healed. I'm confident that this man recognized that he was a sinner, that he was in need of forgiveness. I don't think Jesus would have forgiven him uh, of his sins otherwise. 
But I can't help but wonder what went through the minds of some of the other people on this occasion when Jesus says to him, you know, your, your sins are forgiven. It's a, you know, I can see people sitting there thinking, doesn't Jesus understand what's going on here? This man wants to walk. Why is he talking about the forgiveness of sins? And the reason is because Jesus understood that this man had a greater problem than his inability to stand up and walk. And it would be helpful for us if we could get to the point in our lives where we recognize that our, we have spiritual needs that really supersede, that are greater than our physical needs. When, when something is wrong with us physically, we just instinctively do something about that. We want the problem fixed. But when the problem is spiritual in nature, how often do people simply sit back and do absolutely nothing about that? Uh, you know, there's no, man, get on the phone. We need to make an appointment of some kind. We need to fix this problem right away because there is a, a, an issue here that needs to be dealt with. No, that's not how it works. I said a moment ago, I wonder what went through the minds of some of the people who were there. We know what went through some people's minds. In verses 6 and 7, some of the scribes were sitting there and questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And I'll just tell you what, in some sense, these men accurately concluded that there's not anyone who can can forgive sins but God. He's the only one who can do that. The problem with these men is that they were not open to the idea that Jesus was in fact God in human flesh and therefore able to forgive sins. As Jesus will say down in verse 10, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. They didn't recognize that, but he could do that. And of course, that we see in this chapter, Jesus read people's minds. We know what went through the minds of the scribes when Jesus said that the paralyzed man's sins were forgiven. But I'd like to know what went through their minds when Jesus made a comment about what they were merely thinking. In verse 8, Jesus immediately perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? He knew what they were thinking. He knew what was in people's hearts. John talks about that in John chapter 2 and verses 24 and 25. He knew what was in man. He didn't need anybody to testify about man. He already knew what's there. And I'll I'll ask you, how would you like to have been in the presence of Jesus and have him read what was on your mind? Actually, we would do well to recognize that although we may not be physically in the presence of Jesus, he does know what is in our minds. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Jesus knows. God knows. And I'll tell you what, that can be frightening, but it can also be comforting as well. One of my favorite passages in the New Testament is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. Paul says there, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, he says, Do not pronounce judgment for the, before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. That sounds kind of fearful, doesn't it? God's going to come and he's going to, you know, everything's going to be opened up and laid bare before him, but I like how this ends. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to receive accommodation. Their people are going to be condemned, and we need to recognize that. But if we are serving the Lord faithfully, if we're doing the things that we ought to do, if we're the people that we ought to be, and our hearts are what they should be, this is going to be a good thing on this occasion. God knows those who are trying to serve him. And he's going to, he's going to bring to light the things that nobody else sees, and he's going to disclose the purposes of our hearts, even when nobody else knows what they are. And if we are serving him or trying to do the best we can in that, we will receive a, con- a commendation from God. God will, re- God will reward us for that. And that's a comforting thought. So that's what we learn about Jesus. But what about this paralyzed man? And I'm going to tack on his friends there as well. What do we learn about them in this text? And the first thing I want you to, to notice is that they were confident that Jesus had to an- the answer to the problem they were trying to address. Again, I'm not sure they came to Jesus with a completely accurate understanding of the problem that needed to be addressed. But it's clear that they believed that Jesus had the answer to this paralyzed man's problem. And you can't help but see that in their actions. There is no other explanation for what these people did. As far as I know, 
most people will not tear the roof off of a house unless they are convinced that tearing the roof off of a house is somehow, some way going to help the situation. Generally speaking, that's how that works. These people knew that Jesus could help. And not only did these men understand that Jesus had the answer to the problem they were dealing with, the other thing you can say about them is that they were willing to do whatever it was that was necessary in order to get to Jesus so that he could take care of the problem. That's an extremely important point. Because I'll tell you, I'm not sure that everyone who recognizes that Jesus can help is willing to do whatever it takes to get to him. And that's unfortunate. Can you imagine what people were thinking when these men began tearing a hole in the roof of this house? I wouldn't be surprised if some were thinking, what are these crazy people doing? What is going on here? Wouldn't you think that? I especially wonder what the owner of this house is thinking. I don't know if this is, if this is the, the home of Simon Peter or someone else. Probably, probably is Peter's home. But I'm pretty sure the owner was interested in what's going on. One minute he's listening to Jesus preach, the next minute there is a hole being formed in the roof of his house, and that would have made it pretty hard for me to pay attention. It would have been difficult. But let me ask you this. Would you have been willing to do what these men did? Would you have been willing to be viewed as strange by the crowd? I tell you what, I don't know how you wouldn't be viewed that way, tearing a hole in someone's roof. But that's how they would have been looked upon. But let me say that if we're willing to be, if we're, if we're going to be faithful to the Lord, then we're going to be viewed strange by some people in this world. It's just going to happen. Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 4, they think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation. And they heap abuse on you. They, they look at the life that we live, people in the world, and they think that, that doesn't make any sense. That, that's, that's ridiculous. Why would anybody live like that? We have to be willing to take that. What do we learn about the scribes? First of all, I want you to notice that they're not really interested in listening to Jesus. Not because they believe that he might have been the Christ or someone worthwhile to listen to. They listened to Jesus because they wanted to catch him in some kind of error. Isn't that sad? You ever noticed how often the scribes as well as the other leaders of the Jews were around Jesus? You know, in all these stories we read about in the Gospels, just about everywhere he went, we find either the scribes or the Pharisees or the Sadducees or somebody in the, among the Jewish leaders who, who were there. But that doesn't mean that they were interested in listening to what he said so that they could apply it to their lives. They weren't hanging on his every word because they wanted to be better people. They were there because they wanted to critique not only everything he said, but everything he did as well. And I don't know what it is about people, but we have a tendency to make up our minds about something even before we really know anything about it. You ever notice that? Something comes on the the news or it's on the internet, and and we know nothing about the circumstances at hand, but we know exactly what needs to be done in response to it. That's just the world in which we live. That that has been going on for a long time. That's how many of the Jews were with regard to Jesus. Their minds were made up even before they really knew anything about him. And what we tend to do in situations like that is we just look at things with a critical eye. We look for problems. And that's what many people do still today. They look for the worst in every situation. They don't look at things objectively because that might require them to change in some way. And so they just criticize because things aren't being done the way they want them to be done. And that gets to the real problem that the Jewish rulers had with Jesus. He just wasn't the kind of Messiah they were looking for. He wasn't the kind of Messiah they wanted. Jesus spent time with sinners. Jesus didn't uphold the traditions of men that had grown up around the law of Moses. Jesus was a spiritual leader rather than someone who came along to, you know, kick the Romans out of town. And that's really about all they had to know about Jesus in order to know that he couldn't be the Messiah. They were sadly mistaken. They weren't interested in listening to Jesus and letting him decide how things should be and that they should learn from him. They already had it set in their minds. And second, I want you to see, and here really is the sad thing, that there was no amount of evidence that was going to change their opinion about Jesus. They had already made up their minds. 
and not even a miracle that took place before their very eyes was going to change that. Thing, their minds were made up about Jesus because he didn't fit their expectations. And that's really all that mattered to them. They wanted what they wanted. And it didn't matter how much proof that was offered. There was no amount of proof that could have convinced them that Jesus was the Messiah unless he was willing to fit the mold that they had made for him. And of course, Jesus wasn't, he wasn't willing to do that. He wasn't willing to be forced into their mold. And that bothered them to no end. It's the reason they put him to death ultimately. I don't necessarily think Jesus went out of his way to, to rile up people like the scribes and the Pharisees, at least not most of the time. But the things he did, it accomplished that all the same. Every time Jesus turned around, the leaders of the Jews were bothered by something he did or they were bothered by something he said. And the problem, of course, wasn't with Jesus. The problem was with the people who were not willing to, to believe in him no matter how much proof he offered. If you remember, Jesus even told them that, that he would be raised three days after being put to death. Go back to, go back to the Gospel of Matthew for just a moment. Matthew chapter 12, and let's read beginning in verse 38. Matthew 12, verse 38. It says, some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And I'll tell you what, there were some people who may not quite have understood what Jesus meant by that. But I think the scribes and the Pharisees understood what he meant by it. Because later on, you turn to Matthew chapter 27 and go down to about verse 62. And this is after Jesus has been put to death. It says, the next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how, this, how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead and the last fraud will be worse than the first. They understood what Jesus meant when he said he was going to be raised after three days. But then he's raised from the dead. Did they change their opinion about Jesus? No, they didn't. Look at chapter 28 of Matthew and about verse 11. The guards, while they were going along, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were sleeping. And if it comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. And so they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. They heard Jesus. They believed Jesus. But they didn't believe in Jesus. They witnessed it. Can you see, can you see that they weren't going to believe? And it really didn't matter what happened. Not even him being raised from the dead. You may have noticed on occasion that people can sometimes be hard-headed. Do not look at your spouse right now. Even people who claim to believe in Jesus can be hard-headed. And it doesn't matter what kind of proof is offered from the scripture. Some people will not listen again because their minds are already made up about what they're willing to accept and what they're not willing to accept. Have you ever heard someone say, for example, I wouldn't trade the, the feeling in my heart for all of the Bibles in the world. And you want to know what? I suspect that's exactly right. They wouldn't trade it. And what many people do is they decide what they think about something. And then they automatically assume, uh, this is probably what God thinks about this. Someone has said that God made man in his image. And man quickly returned the favor. And there's some truth in that. And that's why you hear people say things like, my God wouldn't send people to hell, or my God wouldn't require me to do this, or my God wouldn't forbid me to do that. And, and, and you know, when did he tell them that? What we need to understand is that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And his ways are not our ways. 
And the only way that we're ever going to know what he thinks about something is for us to be willing to sit down and to listen. One of my favorite passages in the New Testament is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and about verse 11 where Paul talks about the things that you know, God has in store for us. And he says in verse 11, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? In other words, you can sit here all day, and if I'm quiet, you don't know what's in my mind. You don't know what I'm thinking unless I say something to you about that. And Paul says on that basis, so also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. You don't know what I'm thinking. You don't know what the person sitting next to you is thinking if they don't tell you about it. And if we don't know what one another is thinking, what makes us believe that we will figure out the mind of a God who is immortal and infinite and way above us? We're not going to figure that out on our own. Now, Paul goes on to say there in verse 12 about himself and the other apostles and the prophets Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. God did choose to reveal his mind to us. And we taught people the things that God revealed to us. We have that in the pages of the New Testament. We can know what God thinks when we look to the things that he has said. Apart from that, we just can't do it. And so we have to be open-minded enough to go to the scriptures to figure out what God wants us to know. One thing I like about the Bible is that there's a, a very real sense in which it's a book about people. Some of the people are good, others not quite so much. Some of the examples we find we are to follow. Some examples are just bad examples. We're supposed to reject them. But when we look at what is said about people in the Bible, the most remarkable thing to me is that these people really end up telling us a lot about ourselves, don't they? People don't change much. And so we do live at a different time and in a different place, but we all struggle with the same things. And we all need the same guidance. And that's why the Bible is timeless. I tell you what, the person who says, who looks at what is found in the scriptures and said that the Bible is not relevant to today. It's not relevant to what's going on in the world today. That person either hasn't read the Bible or doesn't know what's going on in the world today because it fits perfectly. The question is, will we learn from what we read? Are we committed to that? Do we want to be the people God wants us to be or have we just already made up our minds and not willing to accept anything else? That's the great question. If you're here tonight and you know that you owe some duty to God, maybe from your study of Scripture, you know where you stand with Him. If there's something you need to take care of, maybe you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, then why not take care of that tonight? Or or maybe you have some questions about things. You'll come and talk to us. I'll tell you what we can do. We can go and we can look at the book and we can find the answers that you need in what God has said. That's what we can do. But if there's some way that we can help you tonight, we ask you to come as we stand and as we sing.